Okay, this is a Kurt Cobain book list, reading list, and today's book is Cobain on Cobain, Interviews and Encounters, edited by Nick Soulsby. This is the greatest book ever. excited about this book and I read this book like six months ago and I'm still excited about this book. Every time I open this book up, I get really excited. It's so cool. I love this book. It's just a collection of interviews, uh, but I just love the way they're presented and put together. It's pretty great. And it's also interesting that at the start of each interview, well most of them anyways, the uh, interviewer was contacted and relays their memories of the interview so that's it's really interesting it's an added little bonus and a reason why you should get this because I mean you could spend your time hunting up all these interviews on your own but I like having them all collected in this beautiful book and reading it as a whole and it kind of uh, creates a picture for you in your mind of Kurt and I mean, just look at the cover. That's a great... I love that. It's one of my favorite pictures of him. That was great. And they're all organized chronologically, and you have here at the index, it tells you when it was published, who the interviewer was, what the publication was. That's pretty great. What country. So I was under the mistaken impression, though, that when I ordered this, it was going to be like every single interview he ever did. It's not. It's not. It's missing a lot. I don't think there's any Rolling Stone interviews in here. Uh, lots of other ones, too, are missing, but it is a huge collection of them. Uh, another thing is that this is kind of misleading, where it says Cobain on Cobain. It makes you think it's just a Kurt interviews, but it's actually Nirvana interviews. It should have been Nirvana on Nirvana. Cobain on Nirvana? I don't know. Uh, but there's interviews in here where it's just Chris or Dave or Dave and Chris. Um, and Kurt's not even interviewed. So that's that's slightly misleading, but I'm very glad for those interviews to be included in here. If you go to the website Live Nirvana, you could I'm pretty sure you can read every single interview that's in this book. But like I said, you're not going to have the experience of sitting down and reading it as like a whole whole picture. I mean, I guess you could. You could spend forever. But it's not the same. It's not the same as having a book and opening a book and reading a book. Uh, but if you want to save money, just go to Live Nirvana and you can pretty much read, I'm pretty sure, all the interviews that are in here. Uh, and I believe, I can't, I should have written it down, but I believe Kurt said in an interview that the best interviews are the kind that are just Q&A, uh, and that's mostly what these are, and I actually prefer those too. I don't really like so much uh, the journalistic type of interviews where the interviewer is just like telling a story and it's, it's like heavily slanted to uh, the journalist's perspective. The, the Q&A format is really... Uh, nice because it lets uh, the person being interviewed kind of come across I think as who they are and not as who the interviewer sees them as but I will say I don't mind when the interviewer kind of sets up the scene like I did there's some interviews in here uh, it kind of describes like records in the room or um, books I enjoy that I like knowing influences. So that's interesting when that is included. Just to set the scene. Just to set the scene. So I have it written down that the most obnoxious uh, and worst interview in this book is In the Womb with the new LP, uh, which was published on August 3rd, 1993 for No Trend Press, Germany, and it's by Marcus Kohler. I, I don't know, I don't remember now why I thought it was so obnoxious. Uh, and I really didn't have any desire to reread it. 
<laughs> before sitting down to do this video, so I'm just warning you that seemed super obnoxious to me for some reason. So, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so my favorite interviews in the book were The Dark Side of Nirvana's Kurt Cobain, which was published December 1992 in The Advocate. And after reading that, I actually read that, that it was Kurt's favorite interview that it did because he got to really uh, represent himself as he wanted to be represented. He felt, I guess, like unfairly represented by the press in the past. Uh, but my favorite was probably Back into the State of Mind I'm in Every Few Months, published July 24th, 1993 in Q uh, from the UK by... Phil Sutcliffe. Uh, I really liked that because it was a lot of um, music discussion that wasn't typical of a lot of the other interviews that I read. It went into a lot of detail about uh, recording and um, just it was interesting questions, musical questions that I really enjoyed. That interviewer asked good questions in my opinion. Uh, so I've read that Nirvana was known for being difficult to interview, um, and I can kind of understand that when you read this and you're reading their interviews as a whole, it must have been so mind-numbingly boring to be asked the same questions over and over and over, and they're not even very interesting questions that they are asked over and over. It was just... Like, these interviewers didn't even read any of the other interviews uh, that the band had given before because they would have known that those are just the same old questions they've already been asked. I enjoy uh, creative questions from the interviewer, uh, person, more personal um, questions, creative questions, I guess. Um, and it wasn't like that in the beginning, and I would completely understand giving the interviewers a hard time to make things interesting. All right, so we're going to tell you five interesting things or read five interesting parts of interviews for you. Since there's so many uh, interviews in here, just uh, as an added little bonus for you. All right, so if you've been watching my videos, you know I did a really crappy, horrible a uh, messy video about everything to do that I could find at the time about uh, Kurt and dreaming and sleeping. Um, I found something so interesting in this uh, book I wish I had found <laughs> before I did that video. Uh, you would also know if you watch my videos, um, I've experienced sleep paralysis and I'm very interested in sleep and dream, uh, what do you want to call it? Sleep and dream experiences, phenomena, um, unusual sleep patterns, all that sort of stuff to do with sleep, dreaming. Um, and it turns out, from what I read here, it sounds like Kurt actually suffered from sleep paralysis himself. So this interview is a really early interview. It's from April 27th, 1990, Dirt, USA. Uh, by Laura Begley Bloom and Ann Filson. And then right above the answer to this question it says, This interview was given by Kurd... Kurd... I can't say it when he writes it with the D. Like, how do you pronounce that? Kurd... 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 Kurd Cobain. Uh, lead singer and guitarist of Nirvana this past April when the group played Hampshire College. We were squeezed in between a previously scheduled interview with some annoying, pretentious British snots from the magazine Sounds and Nirvana's soundtrack. So, Kurd, 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 I can't, I can't do the, the sound of an RDT. I don't know why. Anyways. I had the worst dream on the tour bus. I have these same dreams. I'm going insane. It's like a curse. There's like a voodoo curse on me because every time I fall asleep, I'm awake and I can hear the conversation going on in the band. And I look at myself through the corner of my eyes, but I'm paralyzed. And I'm going, you guys, I'm paralyzed. I can't move. It's a dream, but I'm still awake. I feel like I'm on the verge of dying because my lungs are collapsing. After listening to Kurd Babylon 
about his dreams, we launch into a completely different conversation. There's, there's about six bands playing tonight, and rumor has it that Nirvana might get to do a sound check. I wish she had let him babble on more about his dreams or written it down. I wonder if she recorded that. I'd be so interested. It's, it's interesting that he's talking about dreams even in 1990. So that must, it, dreams really must have interested him. I like that. Um, but what he's describing is sleep paralysis. When I first started having sleep paralysis, that would happen. Like if I was sleeping on the couch and other people were like in the downstairs of the house or watching TV, I could hear, I could hear everything. Um, but I was asleep, uh, but I couldn't move. I couldn't open my eyes. Um, or you can like kind of partially, like he was saying, like just kind of partially open your eyes. Um, so it's really interesting. That's a type of sleep paralysis. There's the other type where you um, see things that aren't there uh, in your room. Like you'll see the room, but you'll think something's in the room. Like some people see an old woman. I saw a little dog. <laughs> Everyone's different with their experiences. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. All right, so this next little tidbit comes from I find it embarrassing to have such great expectations placed on us. And this is from November 10th, 1991, Freak Show, Germany. There's a lot of German interviews uh, by Gilbert Blecken. And I just found the end of this interview, the questions, kind of interesting. What would you like Nirvana to be remembered for? And Kurt says, good music and good songs. That's all I can say in answer to that because that's more important than anything else. And then the interviewer. All right, last question. Would you describe yourself as somebody who would go mad without music? And Kurt says, I used to think that, but now that we're playing almost every night on tour, I feel that I'll probably also want to do something else one day. If I keep on like this for another five years, I might burn myself out and no longer have the desire to just keep on playing guitar. I don't know if this is something I'll do forever. There are so many other things that I enjoy just as much. Sometimes I just want to hang out with my friends. I also really like writing and maybe I'll even act in a movie one day. There's so much that I can imagine doing. Maybe I could also be happy being a janitor. I don't know yet. But while that's the way I feel at the moment, I'm sure that after two months off, I'd probably, I'd probably then get to the point where I wanted to be making music again. It's cool. Okay, so this is from the Advocate interview. This is at the very end of the interview, and this is one of the interviews I really liked. And as I said, uh, Kurt's, one of Kurt's favorite interviews that he ever did. The interviewer. Now's your chance to say anything you'd like, Kurt. I always clam up when that question is asked. Maybe I'll just fumble and stutter and end up saying, don't believe everything you read. I always knew to question things. All my life, I never believed most things I read in history books and a lot of things I learned in school. But now I've found I don't have the right to make a judgment on someone based on something I've read. I don't have the right to judge anything. That's the lesson I've learned. I'm going to skip ahead, actually, because uh, I don't want to end on on the one that I have for last, because it might be a kind of a letdown <laughs> to some people. Uh, but I'm a huge Chris Isaac fan, so it was kind of interesting to hear what Kurt thought of Chris Isaac. Um, I wasn't expecting that in this book. This is from Uterine Fury. Uh, from August 1993, Best France, Yuri Lanquette. I don't, I'm sorry if I said the name wrong. This is the interviewer. He's saying, Dave's girlfriend can't stand cigarette smoke, so we move to the terrace so the tobacco addicts can satisfy their vice. Cyril, the contest winner, there was a contest winner hanging out with them, I think, uh, talks about what Chris Isaac said about their music, that he found it calming. The reaction wasn't predictable. And Kurt says, that's exactly what I think of his. No, really, I like his music a lot, and he's a really pleasant person. So yeah, I found that really interesting. I find, I find Nirvana's music very calming and relaxing, which I don't know. I don't know why exactly. Uh, it's satisfying and like releasing, I think. Uh, I'm thinking of that scream in aneurysm. 
Or sometimes he screams and dream you. That scream is the best. It's just, it's so relaxing. It's great. Uh, but in general, in general, I do find Nirvana music very relaxing and energizing at the same time. Uh, but yeah, so it was interesting to see that Kurt liked Chris Isaac. I wasn't expecting that. Okay, so this was from my favorite interview in the book, uh, the one that was back in the state of mind I'm in every few months. And I said the interviewer asked a lot of interesting questions. So this is the interviewer. A lot of the time with your lyrics, although that was one that was supposed to hit you right between the eyes. I don't know what he's talking about. I think it was Rape Me they were talking about. Yeah, they were talking about Rape Me. A lot of the time, it seems to be you use images within one song which are very different, not obviously connected. Kurt says, right. And the interviewer says, I wondered if that had anything to do with your painting and sculpting approach to things at all. And Kurt said, yeah, it does. I've always painted abstracts. I've always thought abstract. I love dreams that don't make sense. I'd much rather watch a film that doesn't have any plot. For me, the reason why most of my lyrics don't connect is that they're all pieces of my poetry. I've used lines from all of these different poems, and in the first place, none of the poems are about anything. They're not thematic. And then I take the lines out of each of them and put them together, and I make up a theme to the lyrics well after the fact, oftentimes as I'm being interviewed or some someone will suggest something and I'll think, hmm, that's a good idea. And the interviewer says, and the point is you think that's okay? And Kurt says, yeah, that's the way people should interpret most of our music. I like that. And that's kind of how I, like when I want to interpret song lyrics, I think of it like a dream, like when you're trying to interpret a dream. Uh, so it could mean one thing to you at one time, and then you come back to a song or a poem at another time, and it's going to mean something completely different, and it's not wrong any of those times. It's um, just like looking at the clouds and seeing what you see, uh, making pictures out of what you see. I like that. And for movies that don't have any plot, um, I'm going to tell you, go watch Black Moon if you've never seen it. I love that movie. That movie is just like having a dream. I wonder if Kurt ever saw that movie. That's the best. It's called Black Moon. Yep, so I definitely recommend this book. Um, I hope I've given you a good idea of what it's like. It's just interviews. Um, as I said, you could find them all online. But it's really fun <laughs> to read it as a whole. But since I made the last Kurt book video, I uh, kind of went crazy. I don't know, maybe some of these I showed in the other video. But I got a whole bunch more books, and I've actually read quite a few of these since then. And I have some on the Kindle. Uh, when I did that Francis Farmer video, it kind of set me off <laughs> to find information. Um, yeah, so there'll be a lot more videos soon <clears throat> on non-fiction Kurt books. <laughs> Not just the fictional books he liked to read. Fictional books he liked to read. Fiction books he liked to read. Uh, there's a lot of other books that I've read. That's a lot. <laughs> so, look for more videos soon. I think I might do, like, I don't know. <clears throat> so see you again soon, I hope. Thanks for watching. If you see this ghoul, play it cool.